was taken in closed session. If we can please stand for the flag salute. <laughs> www.crpusd.org. Members of the public are entitled to speak on matters not on the agenda at this time. Please state your name and address and keep your comments concise, brief, and limited to five minutes or less. A maximum of 20 minutes is allotted to each subject not appearing on the agenda, and a maximum of 20 minutes is allotted at the beginning of the meeting. If there are more speakers than allotted, they are each offered the opportunity to speak for an equal duration of 20 minutes. If the speaker desires to retain a full five minutes, they may speak during the second public comment portion of the meeting near the end of the agenda. The Brown Act restic restricts the board from considering any item not appearing on the posted agenda. Members of the public are entitled to speak to any item on the agenda, either immediately after the item is called by the board president or following background information provided related to the item at the board president's discretion. Each person is entitled to speak on any agenda item only once <clears throat> at any meeting. All the board members may seek additional information, participation, and debate on any item before the board shall be limited to members of the board. Please fill out a comment card, which will be given to the board president, indicating the item you wish to address. Comments are limited to five minutes for individuals and 20 minutes per item. Lisa Burke. Or Tessa Burke? I actually have two items, so I'm not sure which one this is. You could specify. Um, okay. Can you specify what um, the benefits of not turning in work for an N? This is on. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Tessa Burke. I have four children in three different schools in two different cities. I've got a senior and a junior at Tech High and a seventh grader at Lawrence Jones, as well as a third grader that goes to school in Santa Rosa. And I apologize for not having several copies of this information, but I have two. via email grades for two students. One is my child and one is another student. I This was inadvertent. The teacher accidentally sent me someone else's grades. So I was able to compare the two students' grades um, for the exact same assignments in the same class. Um, unfortunately, my daughter had a 65. The other student also has a 65. My daughter earned 447 points and the other student earned 360.5 points. The other student was missing three grades and received an N for not turning in the work. And so I would like the board, I understand you're not answering questions at this time, but my concern is that when a student receives 87 points more than another student, but is getting the same grade it appears that there is no penalty for not turning in work. And I would like to know why students would be motivated to turn in work if it's not counting against them if they do not. That's all I have on that. Thank you. <coughs> 
test group. Okay, and this is in, uh, this is uh, concerning my seventh grader at Lawrence Jones Middle School. We have told all our children not to participate in data mining surveys without parental consent. And he's a very smart boy, so he brought home the California Healthy Kids survey for us rather than turning it in. And I was not happy with some of the questions, including asking my 12-year-old if he's a homosexual or if he's straight or if he's transgender. Um, I did not like that the survey is asking him his specific um, drugs that he's used, whether he's used drugs at school. My personal belief is that this is not appropriate to ask a 12-year-old. My concern is we were not given the option to opt out as far as I am aware. I also have an 11th grader at Tech High and we were sent via email an option to opt out of this health questionnaire. And I think that that needs to be a district policy-wide that parents are given the opportunity to opt out. And I do have two, questions, two copies of the survey if you're not familiar. as to what our policy, it sounds like one school gave the option to opt out and the other one didn't. So, well, I, I would have to do some research. I yeah, mean, so we, I, we have it posted. It's not on the agenda. Yes. But I can ask for information. I'm not asking yeah, to the best of my knowledge, we, we allow anybody to opt out. So right. I would have to find out what happened to Lawrence Jones or didn't. But I have no idea. So, yeah. so I, I would like just to find out. Bring that back. Yeah. Okay. Dan Shecklin. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is uh, Daniel Shacklin. I'm with the to uh, Cutis. I'm here to speak on the grading policy. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I have three kids in the district. One at EXL at Lawrence Jones, one at uh, Seventh Grade Lawrence Jones, and one at Monta Vista. Uh, my kids are happy with their education. They're having a great time. So this is my personal opinion. Um, I grew up with a traditional grading system of 70% uh, being a C. I went to Annaly High. I went to the junior college. I went to uh, USF here in Santa Rosa. And I believe that what we have had traditionally has the bar set at a minimum uh, to succeed in life. Um, I believe that what um, the four-point system or five-point system, depending on what you're referring to, I believe it lowers the bar. I don't believe that getting a zero should equal 59%. And what basically the four-point system does is that if a child receives a zero, they're really not receiving a 10% or 20%. They're really getting the full credit of a zero, where the philosophy is if you get a series of zeros and a series of fours, you're come up, gonna come out with a C grade or a two, at 70%. And um, when a student gets 99% consistently and then gets a 59% or if a student is struggling at 10, 20%, those are two different issues and two different approaches to be taken to that student as to what their needs are. Um, for instance, if a child has a grade based on attendance and they miss 50% of their classes and receive a zero and they get a four for the remainder of their classes, they're gonna come out with a C. I don't think any student should pass a class when they've missed 50% of the classes. I don't believe in the same vein that if a child gets a zero on a series of tests or assignments 
and it gets a series of fours that, again, if they fail 50% of the assignments, they're going to get a passing grade. And I don't think that's what we need to send our children out into society thinking that failing 50% of the time is going to get them by in life. That because they're going to receive a passing grade, they're going to get a false sense that even though they fail, they're still going to succeed. Some children are going to fail. That's a fact of life. And it's our job as parents and society to do everything possible to get them to pass. But giving them a little bump by giving them a, a full credit of a zero is not the right way to go about it, in my opinion. If we have low achieving students, again, we need to do everything possible to make sure that they don't fail or have all the tools to succeed. But lowering the bar for low achieving students to make them pass is a false sense of accomplishment. I've seen <clears throat> these uh, number of point systems in elementary schools, but I was surprised to hear that we would do this for the middle schools and high schools. Examples of <clears throat> people not being able to get by in society on uh, making it at a C level or a two point level when they fail 50% of their classes or, or school or, or test is the trades, <clears throat> electrical, plumbing, mechanics, military. You don't get to go into somebody's home and fail the electrical or fail the plumbing 50% of the time and be okay. Nobody will put up with that. The thing, same thing for professionals. You don't go and get a surgery and have it successful 50% of the time. Pharmacists, you want your prescriptions to be accurate 100% of the time, not 50% and still get a passing grade or a passing pharmacy prescription to yourself. A pilot can't make a successful, <coughs> successful landing 50% of the time and be labeled as accomplished. I don't feel this point system is fair to the higher achievers that we have because my understanding is if you get a four, you're not really getting 100%, you're going to get 90%. I think we need to support the teachers union on this. They are the ones that are spending every day with our kids and they know what's best for our kids. No disrespect to the superintendent or board members, but they're the ones seeing and watching our kids every day. And my understanding is they do not support what is happening. There was a vast <coughs> number of comments in the Press Democrat online. There was letters by the editor. There was the Facebook chatter, and I can only speak from my personal experience. I did not see anybody that came out and said they were totally in support. What I heard was there were some things that needed to be worked through, and my understanding is that was, that's what the teachers' union was asking for, is to go back to the table and start from ground zero and work this back up. I contacted the California State School Board Association, and I was told this is not a tramp to go to this four or five point system that the traditional rating uh, system is what they recommend. I would ask that the board, <coughs> among yourselves, make a motion to revisit this and have it fully explained to you as to exactly what it is the superintendent is asking. And um, I would uh, think that would be best for our children to reconsider what's happened. Thank you, with all due respect. Thanks, Dan. Can I have Mom Hallberg ready, please? Um, my husband is just passing you some information, which is where I got the um, information that I have to talk about tonight. So, and that's like a timeline of the grading scale events as I know it. Uh, first of all, before I start, I'd like to thank Lef Brown. Uh, Lef, you came to Royal King's funeral. The church was filled to capacity to honor such a great teacher and union leader. Uh, many retired teachers were in attendance, and they all commented that they were grateful to see you there as a board member to support uh, the family and the community in the loss of Royal King. So thank you very much for doing that and coming. Uh, last year, educators tried to invite board members to discussions at their schools. I sent the board members an invitation to the middle school meeting. 
Instead of a response from a board member, I received an email from Dr. Haley stating that only administrators can invite board members to schools. The end result is that no board members heard what teachers were saying about the new grading scales last year. You have but one person that you get your information from, and that is a superintendent. When our kids do research projects, we make them gather information from several sources. Otherwise, we consider their writing to be unbalanced and not representative of the information. If you would have come to those meetings at Orange Jones or um, Tech Middle School, you would have heard from a few teachers that supported these new grading scales. But the vast majority that were in attendance were opposed to changing the grading scales. Furthermore, uh, this board is not listening to our teachers at these very board meetings. We had teachers that spoke in opposition to the grading skills at the September and October board meetings. Not one board member reached out to get more information. I heard the superintendent go on two radio shows and one TV program supporting the new grading scales. On TV, I saw the superintendent pointing to grading scales on the whiteboard in his office and extolling his support for them. But the public kept speaking out against the scales. So now instead of supporting the skills, the superintendent claims that they came from teachers. However, I have email documentation that shows the assistant superintendent was planning to impose those new grading skills dating back to January 2015. The superintendent now states that teachers supported these grading skills. He is incorrect. The Rona Park Atati Educators Association is the sole representative of teachers in this district. And we have email documentation dating back to last February stating that we demanded to bargain the effects of the grading skills. Instead of coming to the table, the district gave us the runaround and tried to assert that the new grading skills did not impact our members' academic freedom. On September 24th of this school year, Ripsia's bargaining chair, Carly Hart, wrote a bargaining proposal from Ripsia, which included the following. Ripsia proposes to consult with the district regarding the ambiguities of the new district grading skills until such time as there is agreed upon consistency between board policy, administrative regulations, and administrative directives, teachers shall utilize their professional discretion to grade student progress. Superintendent Haley responded, this is a management decision, not an impact. The district will ensure that there are identified administrators and teachers at each secondary site to provide assistance. On September 29, 2015, Superintendent Haley sent an email to Ripsia's bargaining chair which stated in part, for grades six through 12, the only change is the regulation regarding equal interval grading. I spoke before the board about the association's concerns with the grading scale on October 20th, 2015. I received no response or feedback from the board or the district's administrators. Two days later, the grading story uh, broke in the press Democrat. In the October 22nd issue, the following quote appeared. Katati Runner Park School administrators say the change reflects a national movement to encourage students to strive rather than demoralizing them with low grades that make success seem out of reach. In an October 26th letter to parents, the superintendent began to run away from the grading scale issue, stating in part, unfortunately, the story had quotes in it that seemed to make it appear that some of our teachers, or even myself, thought it was our policy, and that is unfortunate. He went on to tell parents, the grading scale as shown on the front page of the Press Democrat and referenced in their editorial is not sanctioned by the school district and was never discussed, debated, or approved by our board of trustees. This is not true. That grading scale was a screenshot of one of the three grading scales imposed at Morris Jones Middle School. In a November 10th letter from the superintendent to secondary teachers, the superintendent distanced himself from the grading scales when he wrote, Unfortunately, during this process, misinformation made it into our school district organization. The grading committee that met last school year spent a great deal of time looking at issues related to grading, specifically mastery, reporting, and, and the weighting of an F. The final product of this committee resulted in some changes in our board policy and administrative regulation 5121, but these changes did not include using a state-mandated scale district-wide. Teachers need to believe, be able to believe in their administrators and in their board members, and parents and kids need to be able to believe in all of us. This issue has brought shame to our district. The truth is that this administration refused to bargain with the union. They imposed this grading scale implementation on teachers, and when they felt the heat of public pressure, they cut and ran. While board members and administrators, when kids in our class make a mess, 
It's our job as teachers to teach them the life skill of responsibility and have them clean it up. This is a mess. We have tried to work with you to clean it up, but you refuse. Most importantly in life, when you break something, it's important to fix it. You have broken the trust of, that is in the community that the community had in you, and it's your job to put that trust back together so that you don't damage our reputation further. Thank you. Item six: Presentations. We have Mr. Greg Isom here with uh, Isom Advisors and um, hopefully somewhere traveling up Highway 101, John Feinstein with Raymond James. They're going to recap where we are at in terms of our bond sales program related to the 2014 um, bond authorization. How does this work? Maybe it turned off. Turn it off and turn it back on. Good evening. Excited to be here. Um, Charlie for Raymond James. You'd be disappointed that he drove all the way up. <laughs> So, uh, I am here to go over the bond program review, uh, the last sale that we did, and next steps, or you know, where you can stand in the program. <clears throat> so, going back to 2014, voters approved an $80 million bond. Um, series A and Series B bonds from the 2014 election were sold in October 2014 uh, with a par amount of $21 million. And then this last sale that we did, uh, the Series C and D, were just sold in November 2015 with $25.5 million, leaving us about $33.5 million. Um, some good news, and I'll explain why, is that the district anticipates this final bond sale to, to occur in 2017. Um, when we originally set this plan out in 2013-14, I think we're looking at about 2019. Um, so that is some great news that the district will be able to receive its funds sooner rather than later. On page four, this is just the bond sale highlights. Um, so the bonds were sold through a negotiated process with Raymond James on October 26th and 27th. Um, if you guys recall how it typically works on that first day, we kind of go over a preliminary scale on what we think the interest rate environment should be for those exact bonds. Um, and then Raymond James takes those bonds into the market with those established interest rates. And then we make some tweaks based on where investor interest is. Okay. Um, so $25.5 million in current interest bonds, no caps. True interest cost of the 35-year financing was 4.1%, which is pretty dang good, um, which means $25.5 million in principal with $28.8 million in interest, with a total ratio of about $1 in principal to $1.3 in interest for a 35-year current interest bond deal. That's pretty dang good. On page five, this just gives you a graph on kind of when we somewhat started the process and monitoring the interest rate environment. And you can see where the district sold its bonds on October 27th. I'll give your uh, CEO, Ann Barron, all the credit. She said, I really want to price bonds on October 27th. I don't know why she said that. <laughs> but you can see what the interest rate environment has done since that day. So congratulations, Ann Barron. Um, say the district probably Washington. <laughs> He's really tight with the feds. Uh, oh, what's, what's really unique, I mean, it, it was the pure one. Uh, but the <laughs> <laughs> being a realist. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we monitor, we monitor. But really, the, the fact that we're able to price on the 27th compared to even like today, probably saved the tax base, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in unnecessary interest costs. So that's great. Um, so bond program, next steps. Um, as I said, you got about $33.5 million remaining in unissued bond authorization. We're expecting it in fall of 2017. Um, so the debt service constraints, as we call it, that $49 per $100,000 um, assessed valuation tax rate. Um, we're probably going to use a combination on this last sale of current interest bonds and capital appreciation bonds. Um, with the student borrowing cost, we gave a little bit of a buffer. Because um, as I said, we sold bonds at about 4.1%. We're going to assume that rates will rise probably in the future, so we're assuming 4.6 using assumed assessed valuation growth of 3.5%. 
um, will get us all of our money uh, in two years. So that will save the cost of issuance and unnecessary fees. Um, and one thing to consider as well on this last bullet point, you'll see the 3.5% the assessed valuation. Part of the reason why we're able to kind of accelerate the sale of bonds is because your, your tax base has grown so dramatically in the last two to three years. I think it grew at about 7% and 5% in the last two years. As I said, when we were assuming about 3.5%, pretty conservative. Um, so that's why we're able to move that up. If your tax base continues to grow, let's say 5%, 6% in the next two years, um, it'll come at a, at a lower cost as well. Maybe you can even move it up a year earlier depending on what the tax base does. So your tax base is really healthy right now. Um, and, and I'm excited that we'll be able to shave off one of the bond sales and combine it into one final one. On this last page, we went over 81, 82, I want to say a year or two ago. This is just the parameters when it comes to selling bonds um, with what the state <coughs> legislature had passed. And all your bonds have followed within the state guidelines of selling bonds. So overall, it was a great sale um, for the district. And so far, the program has worked out pretty well. So looking at, at the future uh, with you know the fall of 2017, so that the tax years that are going to occur between now and then, there'll be, we'll have new tax base information in the summer of 16, or, and then again in the summer of 17, or late summer, early fall, correct? Correct, yeah, so generally, um, Sonoma County releases its, its tax base assessed valuation um, anywhere from July to September, just depends on how much is going on. So we'll have a very good idea, um, you know, probably, you know, around this time next year, you'll get another update on what your tax base information is and what the assessed valuation has done and give a status of where you stand with the ultimate goal of thinking, quote unquote, that the following year, but the next round of assessed valuation with, that we get from the county that you'll be able to sell those bonds. Right, so so at this point, in terms of, you know, the, what we're looking at, it's a pretty conservative um, look at assessed valuation at three and a half percent. That's that's lower than what we've experienced lately, but of course if we yeah, all know this is gonna happen in the future, we would we would be at bear and <laughs> if we're not. Yeah, I mean, three and a half percent I, it, by So our means, first indicator will be next year. a year before we even look to Correct. go back into the market. Correct. We'll know okay, hey it was three percent, we've got a problem here, or it came in at five or six six percent and now give you more buffer. Correct. Yeah. So this at about August 2016, you'll, you'll have another update, snapshot to give you an idea on, was it really conservative, was it aggressive? It's not gonna be aggressive, um, barring another you know, recession, because as I said, the county still hasn't allowed all their, um... hey, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> you can just, just turn around and go. Charlie, yeah. <laughs> Step up to the podium. I think it's all right. No, so yeah, exactly. A year's time from now, we'll, we'll know exactly where you stand. Um, as I said, if you grow at 5%, in essence, that already bought us the two years to get us to fall 17 and everything's gonna be perfectly fine. So barring another recession, you should be able to get your $33.5 million fall 2017 at this time. Great. Questions for me or Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good job. right out right now. <laughs> Thank you. you. You've Thank done you. a great, great, job. great job. Appreciate the service that we've gotten, and um, we love having you back here. down 101. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we don't want to lose her, but maybe she's the tea leaf reader. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, John? <laughs> uh, Hollister to Kotani is now what you uh, <laughs> want it to be. Well, thanks for dropping by. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good drive. Uh, safe drive. Thank you. Item 7A, student board members report. Start with Mr. Kennedy. All right. So last month, Interact held the Interact Club at Tech High held their Friday Fright Night and it was really successful. They ended up donating all their money to this charity called the Thirst Project. And this foundation aims to help people get clean drinking water and helps build infrastructure to sterilize water. And also this year at Tech High, we changed our shadowing system for eighth graders that want to see Tech High. And uh, it's much more streamlined and it allows shadows to experience our school without having to have to spend the whole day out of school. Following the success of our homecoming, our ASB has decided to plan another dance. We're currently in the, the works, but it is expected to be around January or February. 
and the theme is going to be something like a throwback to the 1900s. In addition, we are thinking about doing some events to lead into our winter break, such as game nights or ice skate nights, and hopefully these will be just as liked by the students. Our fall season for sports has just ended, and our fall sports banquet was last week, Tuesday. And uh, here are just some recaps on the highlights of all the sports. The boys' soccer team made a great improvement from last year. Their win, they, they went from um, one tie and uh, all losses to, um, to a .500 win percentage, which was their best ever, and they finished off third in their league. The girls' soccer team advanced to the quarterfinals, which was in Middletown, and this is the farthest any Tech High sport has ever advanced to. They also had a very, very high win percentage with 15 wins, five losses, and one tie. And finally, the cross country team just finished their CMC meet last Thursday. The girls team got second place to Sonoma Academy, and the boys and J the boys varsity and JV teams both got third. Uh, some notable medal winners include, and these guys are really fast, um, David Ramirez for varsity boys, and Iris Berto and Leia Haley for the girls team. And uh, the volleyball team won eight games this season, which is what they told me. <laughs> <laughs> um, our last month has focused on helping our community. We announced teams at Brave for our pink games in order to raise money for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We finished our month of October by raising over $1,500 to be donated to Cider Women's Health in Santa Rosa. Uh, we held our Ribbon Week where we wore colors to spread awareness for issues such as bullying, suicide, and drinking. We began our camp food drive last week and hope to match our goal for, from last year of 27,000 pounds of food to be no, donated across the street to Noah. We had our annual Halloween competition for which gave prizes for the funniest, most creative, scariest, and cutest costumes. Me and my friend won the funniest. We were blades of glory. Um, we held our first chili cook-off during a JV football game, which had football goers trying six different chilies and voting for their favorites. This event was widely popular, especially in the away teams. Uh, we held our football senior night, and our spirit commissioners decorated the stands with the boys' numbers, names, and handed out cutouts of the players' faces which was a new fan favorite. ASB is planning upcoming basketball season uh, Spirit Days. Our first game against Anley on, or our game against Anley on December 7th will have a hippie theme. Uh, we are excited for our boys soccer because they moved up the division, so they are part of our winter sports now, and we are planning uh, crew games for them as well. We are preparing for our winter spirit week and the rally. The theme of the rally is musicals for our air band skits. In the rally, the seniors have chosen High School Musical, the juniors have chosen Grease, the sophomores have chosen The Lion King, and the freshmen have chosen Hairspray. And we are excited for the next few very busy weeks. Thank you, Melissa. Item 7B, receipt of official correspondence. We've received a letter from Sonoma County Office of Education. Item C, board member report. Sushi Brown. Closer, so I have to lean part into it. Um, as Maha mentioned, I, I did attend Royal King's funeral service, and I just want to comment a little bit about the service, a little bit about Royal King. I got to know Royal better after he retired and he was a substitute. I remember having several long conversations with him at football games and, and got to know a little bit more about it. But what really struck me about Royal was his, his commitment and to service in his life. Um, he was honored at his service, at the service by the Navy, so he gave time there. Um, he gave 34 years to our district as a teacher. Um, he and, and, and his other commitment, which was really moving, was, was his family. He was one of 12 kids, and from a smaller family of two, I, you, know, I, you can't realize the power of a family and how it, how it stuck together. And his stories and the stories of the family, um, there is, there's a teacher side of it. I mean, Lanny spoke and, and Andy went home and um, Guthrie, Susan? Yeah. Kathy Guthrie spoke. You know, I remember teachers from 
20 years ago when my kids were in school. And, and I appreciated that, and talking about his contributions to the union and that, but what was really, that struck to me was his, his contributions and his dedication and balance of life to his family. And the stories of raising his kid in the hard love and um, I didn't know that about Royal. I didn't know about how much he invested in his family and talking. I love the story about two kids living in the house and one having to pay rent and the other one not. And one paying rent, one of them why? Because he'd made some bad decisions and some tough love and, you know, and the successes. So that was really good. And then, and then one other thing that, 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 that made the service, even though the service was two hours, um, the music uh, presentations from family and close ministers um, just were really soulful and, and heartfelt and, and just um, really brought home the story of the royal's life. And um, there was one other um, I don't know, it escapes me a bit, but it was just, it was a, a great service, two hours. I don't think I've been to a funeral that's been two hours before. Um, but it went by so quick, but at the same time, it was just a tribute to, to one of our teachers, a tribute to one of our community members, a tribute to someone who served in the service. So um, I just want to thank Royal for his time, you know, teaching here. As Lanny said, we didn't always agree when he was on the other side of the table, but I want to thank him for his contributions to our community, to his family, <coughs> to, our, to our service. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee John. Trustee Carroll? I got to this month see the Rancho Band come play at Evergreen Elementary, and I know that they go there last in the day, but they still had a bunch of energy, and to watch them interact with the kids and play their music and see how many of them had come from Evergreen, it was really fun. It was a, it was a fun afternoon, a great way to end the day before Halloween. Usually, I guess it's Halloween, but the day before Halloween. Um, I also got to go this weekend to the Lawrence Jones Lion King play. It absolutely blew me away. The set and the costumes and the choreography and Jill over there did such a great job with those kids. It was fantastic. Um, thank you. Trustee Gillardy? Yes. Okay. Trustee Ola? Yes. All second that I saw the play as well. Uh, one of the best productions uh, Jill Shack has ever done in my opinion. I think she had over 30 um, actors involved and, uh, and community uh, members from the high school acted um, as volunteers with lighting and sound. And it, was, uh, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I want to also um, recognize the band. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but they were in a competition in Napa they had to hustle to get to the playoff game on Saturday night. So they were busy all day last Saturday, and I watched them hustle off a bus into the stadium, and uh, they didn't miss a beat. Uh, they were uh, on top of their game, and I expect we'll see them this weekend, too. Um, the, um, let's see, a couple other things. I want to, um, there was a comment earlier about public trust. I just want to thank everybody who worked. I mean, I'm sure we'll hear about this again later, but we passed Measure B. And if that's not a signal of public trust, I don't know what it is. With that, I'll send it off. Thank you, Trustee Orla. I had the privilege of meeting with quite a few teachers and discussing their thoughts and their practices on how they're grading in their classrooms and found you know, what they're doing is what's best for their kids. And if parents have questions on how their children's grades are, then they need to contact their teacher and discuss what's going on in their classroom. And if they can't figure out what's going on by talking to the teacher, then they need to contact their principal. But we have fantastic things happening in our classrooms, and our teachers are doing a great job educating our kids, and it's just about communication. And if you need to know what's happening in your kid's classroom, you need to contact your teacher. Um, Got to go to quite a few football games. Also wanted to make a note of the band. There's nothing more awesome than going to an away game and having our band there and told to rock it on the other side of that no sound. So nothing like a little Rancho Cooper pride to lead the way. So um, 
I think, think we have a great year coming to an end, and I'm looking forward to 2016. And I'm also very excited that uh, the extension of Measure D has passed. So thank you for all those that have put in as much time and energy, and thank you to our voters to continue to continue um, supporting the kids in our school district because we can't do it without them. We can't, and I can't say that enough. Thank you. Okay, item D, Chief Business Officials Report. I don't really have anything new to report on the new housing. Um, Brookfield has informed us that they're going to be selling off the first three phases uh, to other developers. Um, we're still hopeful we'll see new kids in houses before the end of the school year. There's really? roads going in. Yeah. Curves are pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, curves are in. No, there's actually asphalt. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, the other item the treasurer's report is posted on the website. We're continuing to experience very low rates. Um, now that we have money with the county treasurer, we can be happy rates are going up because we'll stand to earn more than we'll have to pay. So, other than that, I'll pass it away. Item E, Assistant Superintendent's Report. Thank you. Um, I don't have a ton to report just yet, but I really want to thank everybody. The last couple weeks have been fabulous. Getting to listen to a lot of folks, really going to try and make it out to all the school sites and again, be a good listener. And I just want to thank everybody for making me feel so welcome here. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Superintendent's report? Yes, on the agenda we have the Committee to Protect Katati Roner Park Schools. Um, when this agenda was being prepared and, and ready for you this past week, we did not have the final results um, available, the official final results. We have received those, and um, so at your December board meeting, we'll have that on the agenda for you to receive the official results from the county. But we do now know that the final result is 68.3%. Uh, um, it's always very difficult to um, pass the threshold of 66.7 required by the state constitution for a parcel tax. So really 68.3 is considered a landslide. Uh, there was a time we, we had hopes and dreams of maybe getting to 70%, but uh, that, that dream is eight years away. <laughs> Hopefully never. Uh, with that said, we have with us tonight um, uh, Susan Adams, I'd ask her to come to the podium. Susan has been the chair, co-chair of the Committee to Protect Tidy Road Park Schools now through three elections beginning in 2012, uh, in 2014, and uh, this year. And, uh, we've asked her to say a few words on behalf of the committee. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be with you here this evening to celebrate our successful Yes on Measure B campaign. I'd like to thank everyone in the room tonight, including our student reps, who attended committee meetings, solicited and gave campaign contributions, took pictures, made telephone calls, collected endorsements, walked precincts, placed signs, both large and small, and of course we have the help of a world-class political consultant, Joy Tatarka of TVWB and our fantastic team. Special thanks to Moha Greg Reddy, president of the Roner Park Katati Educators Association and the members of her union. At Maha's invitation, Pam Stafford and I attended a RIPC board meeting in early September. We came seeking an endorsement, a monetary contribution, and sorely needed campaign workers. We were freely given all three. As I reviewed my records, I found 45 teachers at least who participated in phone banks and in handing out flyers during our final weekend get out the vote efforts. The help we received from the admin team, as they're called, was also invaluable. Many of you are here tonight and I thank you for lending our committee your generous time and talents. I counted among our volunteer callers and precinct walkers nearly every single principal and member of the admin team. I'd like to thank Trustee President Jennifer Wiltermoon for hosting call nights at her office, placing lawn signs and handing out yes on B flyers. Thank you to Trustee Tracy Farrell for help in placing signs and in handing out flower, for flyers, and to her husband Patrick who spent hours helping place large signs. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Mark Orloff, who diligently represented the board during every meeting and made phone calls during our campaign. And thanks to Pam Stafford, whose deep knowledge of all things political in town rounded out our core campaign team. 
Special thanks to Dr. Haley, Ann Barron, and Minnie McKeon, whose tireless efforts to pass Measure B nearly dwarfed my own. When my We should just skip this part. Take your time. Deep breath. When my son was unexpectedly hospitalized in September, you stepped in and did your work and my work for almost a solid week. I was very touched by that. And again in October, when I broke my ankle, you stepped in and helped again with my workload. We are thrilled to have the backing of our community, which clearly supports and values our local schools. The voters of Katani and Miller Park have been especially generous with our school district. In 2012, the voters gave you $6 million. In 2014, the voters gave us $80 million. And in 2015, in a clear signal that they trust this Board of Trustees and the administration and are happy with the district-wide changes, voters renewed our parcel tax and gave our district an additional $9.6 million. Think about that for a minute. That's $95.6 million. It's a breathtaking and sobering amount when you think about it. And I'm honored to have placed, played a small part in raising those funds. want to say anything I, I'll go first I just appreciate your your hard work uh, your volunteerism um, you and I've spoken quite a bit occasionally uh, we laugh about different things and people assume you have some special place in the district and and maybe that's true because you show up and you work hard and you do things and you ask questions and um, we joke about somebody who asks you, well, well, what's Susan Adams' ulterior motive? Great schools for her kids and the community, I think. I'm not sure what it is beyond that. Um, I certainly admire your willingness to get in there and put in long hours for often little thanks, but uh, certainly I can say I give you my heartfelt thanks. And it's tough to sometimes be out there in the limelight working hard for something, but you never shy away. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'll, I'll echo that. I, I think uh, you're one of the hardest working people in this community as it pertains to our schools. Um, I think we would have been hard pressed to pass the last three measures without your help. Um, and uh, obviously there are a lot of other people involved, but every group needs a leader, and you're a great leader. Um, I'd also like to thank um, you know, everybody else who, who, is, who has touched this process over the last, since 2012. I think it's noteworthy that um, you know, with, with seemingly our small groups of people, we're able to, to get very huge results. Um, you know, specifically, I'd also like to add, you know, Dr. Hanley, you spent an inordinate amount of time on this election. Um, not that you didn't spend other election times, but you know when Susan went down for the count. <laughs> I mean, it's the law of three. You know, she, she it's not only her she, two sons and a, and herself going down with uh, medical issues. Um, I, I saw Dr. Haley walk numerous precincts, host very or numerous call nights. Um, you know, in addition to others. You know, and uh, quite frankly. I don't think we would be where we're at today without the two of you. And I thank you. Can you do that? It's all about roots. The ones you come from and the one that you're embedding. And we are just making the roots stronger for our community. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know, Jennifer, um, you had a, a lot going on this summer, a family wedding, and then Founders Day, and the day after Founders Day, I don't remember calling you and saying, all right, let's get going here. You just showed up the next day and started helping. And that was just really, really impressive. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
We've been doing quite a bit of work revising our website. Uh, maybe at an upcoming meeting we can um, pull it up and, and walk through it. Uh, it's a pretty major revision that we've gone through working with um, School Wires, which is now owned by Blackboard. We, we joke about that, but we find these companies that get bought by other companies quite frequently. Blackboard seems to be one of them. Um, and in the past, uh, we did quite a bit of uh, revising of our board policies. And one of them involved the website and marketing. And we've had it on the back burner, but one of the things that we wanted to do is go out into the community and work with school-related um, local businesses that might be interested in, in marketing through our website, which could bring in some funds for our school district to turn around and put back into our marketing budget um, and just showcase these types of local companies. We finally took it off the back burner and we put it on the front burner and we um, decided to work with uh, a, a new local company called Fundamonium, uh, which has a very strong community and school connection. It's a place for kids to go and have fun doing things, Fundamonium. And um, we've met the owner, uh, I've met the owner through the Chamber of Commerce and the school district's a member of the Roner Park and Katati Chambers of Commerce and I do sit on the Roner Park Chamber of Commerce board. So um, we decided that was a good place to start. So Mr. Jones and I have been uh, working with Fundamonium to see what's the best way to um, market with them and what's the right pricing to charge with them. And when we have all that figured out, we'll give other local companies the same opportunity as long as there's a real strong uh, school connectedness and appropriate, uh, appropriateness um, for that particular company. So that's something we think is um, a nice connection to the community. And then I believe in the agenda, or we're handing it out, we're handing out a draft of um, calendar, regular board meeting dates for 2016. This is something that uh, will be part of your organizational meeting in December. Uh, but just so you have some a planning document between now and then. This calendar is based on replicating the 2015 calendar, so if that looks appropriate, um, you can let us know. If you have suggested changes now, that's fine. If there's anything, you know, if you want different calendars prepared for you before December, let us know, but our default would be to present to you in December um, this calendar unless directed otherwise. <coughs> In the category of other, uh, I continue to enjoy getting out to school sites. Uh, recently visited Lawrence Jones on um, their short Wednesday. Um, visited almost all of the schools. I think next on my list is going to be to get back over to Thomas Page Academy. Yes, and uh, now that the punch list there is, is getting very small um, to, to see what they're doing. I, I go over there quite frequently sneak in and around and look at the signage and see how things are progressing but uh, you know, enjoy spending the morning there um, and then perhaps a lunch there on a Tuesday and get to interact with the, the staff and get their perception on our new buildings and our modernization project so it's always a good time. Great. Thank you Dr. Haley. Item 8 consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve item 8 a, B, C, F, H, I, and J. So moved. Can I get a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 8, D. So I have a question about um, the lease and, and the lease of Denton number two and then point 0.67. If you can just clarify to me, so due to the delay in occupancy, the base rent escalations outlined in paragraph 54 of the lease will be modified with the schedule below. So, so originally we expected to take possession of the premises in Martin that are going to house a new maintenance facility back last spring. Right. Because remediation had to be done for mold and other issues, we have just in the last few weeks taken possession. As part of our negotiation of the lease, we had a period of free rent, and then there was a schedule of what the rent increases would be. I didn't feel uh, and was not willing to agree to give up that time at those lower rates, the free rent period and the lower rent period, 
So when we um, revised the lease to reflect the fact that we took occupancy later, I wanted it made very clear that the rent escalation would be postponed into the future, that we were not giving that to the landlord. So that's what that is about. Okay, thank you. Can I get any other questions? I move we ratify uh, the amended lease agreement for Martin Avenue Maintenance and Operations Facility. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 8E, ratification of agreement for legal services with Orbach, Huff, Swartz, and Henderson LLP. So this agreement, I have questions about this. This agreement with this um, legal firm, which I online their support construction so I assume that they are going to support all construction no. or just yeah. the tag this building is very limited it will not be the tag building the attorney at Dennis Oliver and Kelly that we have been working with on our lease lease back documents and our other facilities documents left Dennis Oliver and Kelly and went to this firm we were midstream with the contract for the maintenance facility, that construction contract. And it seems it's simpler and cheaper to finish with Glenn Gold, that's his name, than to get someone else at Dana Swallower and Kelly up to speed. Our expectation is that we will complete that transaction with him. It will be uh, very low cost. I think we just got the invoice and it's about $1,100. Um, and then our future legal work will be done by Dennis Walter and Kelly, who represents the district in most other matters except special education. So then, will this agreement then expire after that's completed? Because this says, or will we keep this open for the future? You, we've had, we have other law firms agreements with that if we never use them, there's no cost to the district. I understand that. Just, you know, just to make sure, because if you, do the rates change and that and then using what I did professional we get service. An annual renewal. renewal. Right, okay. But and then, uh, then the fees from those would pay for out of the bond? Correct, when it's related to a specific project, the bond okay. fund. Just as the lease lease back legal fees also were paid for. The and there's fund. no, so the attorneys left one firm and went to the other, so there's obviously, if they're doing the work, there's no client privilege thing that says that they can go to one other business, you know, and start and finish the work. They don't have any problems with that? There are no problems. Dennis Walliver and Kelly is aware of what we've done and okay. we're not in, we have no interest in making a conflict issue okay. out of this. All right. Saving money. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Can I get a motion to ratify the agreement for legal services with the Orba F Swartz? and Henderson LLP. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 8G, ratification of agreement with School Works Inc. for developer fee study. So questions on the developer fee uh, study, I realize you have to do this to increase the rates and improve that. Um, so first question, how does this affect the current um, housing um, on University Square? Is that, do they have a set rate already? They do not. Okay, so that answers so, that question. Right, and the timing Our goal is, is to get it moved up. The state allocation board is scheduled to act. They, every two years, have to assist, review the rates, the maximums, and decide whether they can be increased or not, and it's based on inflation and other things. They are scheduled to do that in January. Because we are about to have develop developers coming to pay fees, we want to move as quickly as possible to increase the rates. Um, and that means there is a timeline where we have to have public notice and public hearings and the board has to take action. So assuming that we're able to raise rates, it's like a 60-day process. Well, we don't want to leave any money on the table by being tardy. So the goal here is to be ready and for them to have the study basically ready to go. The state allocation board acts, they can plug in the information and we'll have an item to bring to you in February that will enable us to raise the rates appropriately. Okay. So you said the magic word, leaving money on the table. Will they give us a map 
of what our boundaries are in this study, or is that without being not part of that? That is not part of okay. what the developers do. We have that. Okay, because I'd like to get it, because as I see the hotel going up next to Home Depot, I, I just cringe that that still might be part of Bellevue. Which the it Oxford is. Suites paid developer fees. No, so well, there's different, there's different I, I can, if you want to meet with me sometime, I can show you a pretty detailed line of where the district boundaries go. That area is interesting on the west side of the freeway. Because I thought when they built Walmart, those fees went to... That went to Bellevue. Bellevue. I didn't know how far that, if that encompassed Home Depot. Yes. Or it does, but it doesn't include the hotel that's right if you next look, to it. If you right. look along... It's not in the bath. Is it the bath? All the no, commerce. No. No. It comes. It comes from the west to the east. It gets to mm -hmm. commerce, mm -hmm. and it goes along the west side of so commerce, and it makes or is it Redwood, Redwood, Drive? Redwood Drive? Not, Drive not on commerce is on the other side. Yeah. Redwood, Redwood Drive, and it kind of hugs along that. But I, I, I'd certainly be happy yeah. to show you that. But, you know that. I believe Tracy, you're on the boundary committee for the county. Now. That's I'm what? Trustee Wiltermoon. Oh, Wiltermoon. <laughs> okay. I didn't know why, why, you know, I know a lot of it. And there's never any meetings for that. And, and Larry and I have always, you know, in the history of, you know, on the board, you know, screamed that these boundaries don't follow our city, our district boundaries. So consequently, when you see certain developments going in, we don't always get those fees. So that's very right. frustrating. Mm -hmm. So. Just bringing that up again, I'd like to see a new map um, just so I can be more familiar with it. And then, whenever we can, um, I think Peter's our county rep. I think. So, if I ever see Peter, I will remind him that you know the boundaries should, at least in my opinion, should follow city boundaries too, so that the taxes you know come back to. You know. It's another. It's another item we we had on the back burner. Right. Um, the district last went through the reorganization process in about 2005. It may not have been resolved until about 2006. Um, and that was uh, land transfer primarily on the uh, eastern side of the school district um, along Keyser and that area over right. there, but well, where the university district is. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and actually would be instructed because that was that process was led by the owner, Brookfield, right. not the school district. The school district signed on to support it. So we do have two really critical areas that we're looking at. The northeast specific plan area, which is the area adjacent to the university district on the other side of Geezer Road. That's currently still, you walk about 50 feet from Lawrence Jones Middle School, and you're in Santa Rosa City High School District and Bellevue yeah, Union yeah. District. Yeah. So we really believe that that land should appropriately be in Katati Runner Park. And then there are some other issues on the other side of the freeway um, in that area that you mentioned. Just need to keep that alive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's revenue and it's important. It's a never ending battle. It is. Move we ratify the agreement with School Works Inc. for developer fee study. I get a second. I'll, I'll second. second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item nine. Anything on that? Educational services. Nothing to not. Item ten. Personnel services. Can I get a motion to ratify personal action report one five one six dash four H? I have a question. So, I'm 10 at it, right? So, so do my forecasting at work. The fiscal uh, note here, cost of the changes listed on the attachment are planned in this year's budget. How do you plan disabilities? Leave of absences? I mean, do we have a we set do, amount of money do, set aside? We do estimate budget for that. Pardon for, me? For we for estimate budget for that. For long-term substitutes, we do. There, we have some historical averages of, you know, here's normal sub costs. We allocate roughly eight days for certificated FTE of the positions we get subs for. And then we know over time we have two kinds of disabilities, if you will, that lead to absences. We have maternity leaves and we have 
other medical with typical experience by our older employees. And we have some historical norms, and we know that we will have long-term sub-needs above and beyond what um, our normal allocation is, and we budget for that. Can we ever, I do the same thing at work, I mean, I had a firefighter break his leg this last week, and it's like, Another one. that cost me a lot of money, you know, not only because, just because of the nature of public safety employees. Mm -hmm. um, do we ever go over budget in any of these categories? So if we did, then we would really kind of have to amend budget, or it wouldn't, you know, how do you how do you do that if we're out of budget? It says the costs are, are listed on this year's budget. So uh, we adjust the budget every month, then we do look at these trends. I mean, primarily our major reporting periods, first interim, second interim. First interim for substitutes, you're adjusting it saying, okay, we might have a slightly different number of FTEs than we built the adopted budget on, so have I got enough allocated for all those people. By second interim, we'll kind of have a pretty good handle on what our experience for the year looked like. And if we say, wow, we've had way more long-term subs, which happened, I want to say about five years ago, I was still my first couple years with the district, and I went to wait and said, what is going on with long-term subs? Well, it was a year where we had a lot of maternity leaves, mm -hmm. and um, we adjusted the budget. You know, partly through the year, we increased the budget. We have to find somewhere to get it. Um, for this year, we have enough fund balance that we would be okay. So, so a penny re re request, could you add on there, you know, our plan in this year's budget, and then budget, the appropriate budget adjustments will be done if, if we go outside of the budget at this point? I can read. I mean, that's just verbiage. I mean, for me, for me, it says okay, the plan. But, you know, we, we talk about you know fluctuations. I don't know if our fluctuations. Well, what we do want the converse would be when it's something discretionary outside of the budget. That's where we usually note note it. Right. So, in other words, if it's an employee going out on a leave, it's it's not discretionary whatsoever in the district. We'll have to take money from somewhere else to support that, even if that budget's depleted. So. Usually then when it's something, if we're adding a new position, if we're changing something that, hey, that's going to result in a change to the budget, then we highlight that. So that note, we, we've got the high school, due to the shortage of teachers, we've got a 1.2, you know, because we couldn't fill that. But I understand that 0.2 is added up to FDE that we didn't have. But we said better. Yeah, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Understood. See you. Yes. And I give a motion to ratify personal action report 1516-4A certificate. So moved. Can I get a second? I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Can I get a motion to ratify personal action report 1516-4B classified? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 10C. Can I get a motion to approve declaration of need for fully qualified educators? Move we approve the de declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Can I get a second? I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 11A, <coughs> Business and Operation Services. So as promised, the new pot of money, another plan. Um, we are required to have the two-step process for this plan, so you're not being asked to act on the plan tonight. We're just presenting it to you for review. You could direct us to do something different, and then we'll bring it back in December for you to approve the plan. Um, just to review history briefly, when we adopted our budget in June, the one-time money from the state was all going to be uh, unrestricted. The district would have the ability to use it on whatever the board decided. When the final state budget was enacted in July, um, a deal had been made taking part of that unrestricted money and putting it towards educator effectiveness. Well, we had already built our budget knowing we were going to get that money, so our plan for the money is to use it for things we were already going to do. 
um, and they're what's listed on the spreadsheet. Number one is beginning teacher support, the BITSA program and pre-intern support for some pre-interns we have. Um, the other item that we're planning is to do a professional development for teachers and administrators tied to the state content standards, previously called Common Core, because they didn't do another round of Common Core funding. Um, and it is money that we have uh, three years to spend. We're getting $457,000. So um, I always like to spend the money sooner than later because you don't want to get to that final June and say, uh-oh, we've got $20,000. We're going to have to get that because we can spend it. Um, and Thus far, we have not had that problem. No, I, <laughs> I would never let that happen. <laughs> but, but um, you know, if we have the money now, let's use it now. Um, and then these things will be ongoing needs of the district, so you will use either unrestricted general fund dollars or unrestricted lottery dollars to fund them going forward. Um, and uh, just to point out, this is only a small portion of what we spend on professional development. We use a lot of Title I and Title II money, Title III when it's appropriate, because we understand that instruction is changing and um, we need to support our teachers. We can't expect it to just pop into their heads without them having time to work. <coughs> so, any questions? The question is, how is it that's broken out? K through five and six or 12, is this equally or more? We don't look at it that way. Beginning teachers can come at any grade level, so we've never really tried to say by grade level. Um, the Common Core money is, a, the, the allocation for Common Core really will be working with Julie to say where do we think the greatest need is of things we haven't done yet. And it may be something for all teachers, it may be something for a particular area of focus. Um, but this is only one small right. slice of what we spend. So you know, we, I, I, I just didn't know how this was administered. Is it a week to principal to say, you know, I get X amount of this pot? This is all handled at the district level. Okay. okay. So the, the, the bits of program and the costs associated with okay. that are all handled okay. at the district level. The, professional development piece, which is be part of our coordinated planning that does involve the principles. Okay. All right. Any questions? Item 12A, fiscal update and planning. On item number one, we don't have a lot tonight. That'll really be next month when we look at our first interim report. Um, Parcel tax update. We, we have stopped referring to measures D, measure B, measure B again. So for simplicity's sake and for planning purposes, although when you're campaigning, one doesn't like to say parcel tax, but just for, for district purposes, we will refer to the parcel tax and we will refer to bond authorizations uh, rather than measures because that, that has gotten very confusing. Uh, so the last time maybe you'll see it would be measure B, which did pass, and uh, uh, Susan Adams from the community and the Committee to Protect Tidy Runner Park Schools uh, did indicate, you know, it's, it's somewhere around 9.6 to $10 million, probably closer to $10 million over the life of the eight-year extension. Uh, Any time a new parcel is added, so some amount of math could be done in the university district if that turns out to be somewhere around 16 1800 parcels that will generate a lot of new dollars for the school district um, there are other potential areas in the district uh, that as they come online become new parcels and are subject to the tax um, and then conversely as more people hear about it we have had a few more exemption requests quite a few quite a few quite so that's quite a few, but still at eighty nine dollars yeah. a piece. It takes a lot. We'll still get one for two million dollars. So somewhere around ten million is probably a, a good thing. People to look at the demographics. Some of us are getting yeah, into that. <laughs> yeah. But of course many many of our seniors choose not to apply for the exemption because they We're still under results. what we originally estimated. Um, and in terms of uh, working, you know, to a colloquialism not leave anything on the table I think we got it pretty close um, I can remember sitting in whoever was in the room back in 2012 and, yeah we need $350 a parcel <laughs> and Charles said, yeah that sounds great you're not gonna get it <laughs> that may be what you need but that is not what you can get so 
reality. I think it's great that that we see some improvement, hopefully that stays in place with the state economy, um, and that these dollars can really enrich the educational experience for the students in our school district. And $89 is a reasonable amount. Um, and the extension of eight years uh, does give us some time to really plan ahead and, and not have to come back to the voters right away. Because it's, it's eight on top of the remaining two, so really it's 10 more years. And I think the biggest thing that's from the standpoint of first interim is that we will now be able to include that revenue in the third year. So 2017-18, it makes it very comfortable. Makes our multi-year projection for the county look much better. And for some years to come. On uh, item number three, uh, we had talked about the GASB 45 trust planning. We do have all the documents. We just haven't had time to review all of them. And I suspect, I can just say right now, we won't between now and the December meeting because of the short timeline. So we'll probably bring those back to you in January is a more reasonable estimate. Uh, that doesn't impact us in any way. We haven't had this um, in the past. And so as we budget for the school year and look to the future, even if we just start with a small amount or even if we just get the accounts open, that's a start. Mm -hmm. Uh, facilities update, we really are at the punch list level with all of our projects. Um, if uh, Principal Peterson's smiling, that tells us that they're, they're punching down on the punch list. We see smiles, so that's good. <laughs> um, and then really the big planning item right now, and, and for the district, we're just in a waiting period is the theater academic gymnasium building. That's in the process of going to the Division of State Architect. Um, as we firm up all of those plans that are required by DSA, that gives our general contractor much better leverage to go out and start looking at uh, their subcontractor community and what the bids are likely to be. Um, but we probably won't have firm pricing information, I would say probably until January or February. And that's predicated on both the responsiveness of DSA and, and how many changes they might be requesting. A building of this size, a project of this size, we can expect that DSA is gonna make changes. So I have a question. Now in the warrants, there was a, a check for $250,000 in the state architecture. That's the not plan check I paid. was not happy with that. That is ridiculous. Well, it I, is. that's ridiculous. It's, but not, I mean, it's not negotiable. <laughs> yeah. So is that based on square footage? Is that based upon project? Is that going to go? Is there going to add? If they're going to do changes, are they going to? That's kind of. Yes, like, it can be more. I won't say We've things about We've experienced that before. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. And it's not the ADA anymore. I learned at Rescue last week. It's now the ADAAA because What's the, the law's been modified. So more required. So it could be more than the 250. Quite there. likely, I would say. Unfortunately, the state um, takes a big cut. That's when we talk about soft costs. That's a big one. Right. And and you know, it's not like you can say, "Well, I'd rather go to the state of Arizona to get my clients check." Well, I'm just saying we must have costs. I didn't see it when we did Thomas Page, but where there's yes. similar cost out there. Obviously, then cuts into our bond fees. And, mm -hmm. okay. We, de depending upon the type of project, so for instance, most of the work at Rancho Cotati uh, didn't generate a lot in terms of DSA fees. Right. Um, they take some look at because of the scope of work at path of travel and, and that sort of thing and making sure we're ADAA compliant. Um, at Thomas Page, there was much more DSA oversight of the interior work of the new buildings and then also path and travel, but not on the scale of this building. And the state surely is going to show us what value you're getting from their review, so they will have to make changes. There will be changes. <laughs> yes. Hopefully those changes will cost us lots of money. Generally, the changes cost more than you The want. state rarely gives suggestions of cost savings items. It's like, <laughs> we would like you to double the amount of concrete in this footing. Good luck with that. Thank you. Uh, then we have for you this month's enrollment report. <coughs> continue to track pretty well above uh, where we were a year ago, and that's, that's great.
contacted us about this, I got excited because I thought, extra money. No. no, no, it's not extra money. So the city has two buildings. The city's a successor agency to the redevelopment agency. When they sell the buildings, the Department of Finance has instructed them, they need to have a revenue sharing agreement that spells out on how all the taxing entities are going to receive the money. Um, so they have this agreement, and it's been through legal review, blah, 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 blah. So we're getting about, uh, I don't know, $163,000. Potentially our share should be 38%. Um, but it's not additional money. It will just reduce our state aid. It counts as if it's any other kind of property taxes. But we still need to do our part in signing the agreement. So what we're asking for uh, is the board to approve the resolution that will allow them to sign the agreement and move this forward. Otherwise, the money sits in the escrow account forever. So, question that reduces our state aid, where is that? Where is that money? And I know cities have been fighting, you know, with, with this. Does that reduce the state aid so the state just doesn't have to pay a lesser amount to us? Where is that money going? Well, the Do state we keeps it. The and state then, right? and okay. then it's, it's, in essence, one time money that ends up in their end of fund balance that is available for them to reallocate when they do their budget for 16 to 17. It's, it's, it's similar when we, you know, we used to talk about the revenue limit. Right. And so we had a dollar revenue limit and this represented, you know, three cents of it or something. The state would just give us three cents less than. With LCFF, it's a little bit different but because that aspect of it it's, much it's still the same. state says, okay, you're, you're, you're owed a dollar, but because you got two cents from this, we're only going to give you 98 cents. I'm just curious, are there other uh, pieces of property that the city owns that <coughs> fall under this, this thing? Are, so we could see this again and then it's just going to yes. have a neutral effect on Any, yeah. Anything that the city put into the redevelopment area that they use redevelopment funds or state funds to purchase, right. mm -hmm. that's what this is. So basically states that I gave the city money to buy this to do redevelopment. Now the redevelopment funds have been eliminated. Know, eliminated. You're selling that, so the money's actually going to come back to us, but it's going to be back, spread right. out. The city is losing those funds too, and there's losses and so, you know, depending on that. So there could be some parcels in Katati still, and some parcels yet still. Yeah, I think there's, um, the city had a whole plan, and Katati has their plan, and I think there's another, maybe four pieces of property um, that uh, could still be sold, so. But we yeah. just do our yeah. first yeah. It is a resolution. Yes. Can I get a motion to adopt it? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> Sorry. I won't do it again. I, I move we um, adopt resolution authorizing and approving a revenue sharing agreement between the city of Runner Park and the district. I'll second that. Trustee Brown? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jolari? Yes. Trustee Orloff? Yes. Trustee Wilfred? Yes. 21 years you learned something. Pardon me? I said in 21 years you learned something. <laughs> no, <laughs> not to be confused with that with daily attendance. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I built it first. Item 12C. There you go. So you need to call the item and open a public hearing. Okay. Um, public hearing to discuss Fredo High School Charter Renewal Petition and Direct Stock Greenway. Let's go to public comment. Well, if you, I mean, if it's okay, okay I'll, I'll give a brief okay. introduction and I'll, okay. I'll call on the representatives from Fredo Charter High School. So, a charter school seeking renewal of its charter is encouraged to submit its petition for renewal to the board sufficiently early before the term of the charter is due to expire. Um, we received the original charter from Credo High School <coughs> five years ago, so this would be appropriate time to be looking at its renewal. Each renewal granted by the board shall be 
for a period of five years. Renewals shall be governed by the same standards and criteria that apply to new charter petitions as set forth in Education Code. The Board shall consider the past performance of the charter school's academics, finances, and operations in evaluating the likelihood of future success, along with plans for improvement and thing. The Board shall deny a renewal petition only if it makes a written factual finding setting forth specific facts to support one or more of the following grounds. The charter school presents an unsound educational program for the students enrolled in the school. The petitioners are demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition. The petition does not contain an affirmation of each of the conditions described in Education Code. The petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of the charter provisions in education. The charter school has failed to meet at least one of the following criteria of academic performance described in education code. There are too many for me to list. Uh, with that said, uh, you've all had delivered to you previously the charter renewal petition that we received from uh, Credo High School. Uh, I believe it's within 30 days. We are required to have this public hearing. I think we're okay, or if not, we're pretty close. I uh, want to thank um, Mr. Romer, the executive director. He's been very cooperative with the district in supplying us with documents. And with that, I'll call him to the podium, and you can share whatever, in whatever order you are going to Our board share. President okay. <laughs> I will call Board President Maria Martinez to the podium. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you all again. <clears throat> My name is Maria Martinez, and I have the honor and the pleasure of being a Credo parent and the board president for Credo High School. A longtime proponent of Waldorf education, having a public Waldorf-inspired school has allowed my son to complete a curriculum that spans a 12-year time frame. Five years ago, 29 students embarked on a new adventure, the first public Waldorf-inspired high school, previously just a vision of a dedicated group of educators. Birthing the vision into reality can bring with it labor pains. Having lived through many of them, I can attest that creating credo has had its share. But with eyes on the future and sleeves rolled up, we persevered. We grew stronger. More students came, 177 currently. We became accredited. Curriculum was developed, ultimately meeting UC A through G standards. Waldorf Feeder Schools sent more students excited and enlivened by this dynamic approach to learning. We graduated a class and enrolled a record number of freshmen this fall. We reduced our startup debt and have begun to accumulate a reserve. A strong foundation is being set. Time, perspective, and effort have all helped. I'm excited about the future of Credo as we take our next step and transition to a new site. I am certain more students will come that we can keep our commitment to nurturing independent, critical thinkers who will lead and change the world. We so need them in these times. I look forward to continuing as board president, even after my son graduates next June, to be a part of this amazing school and the people who keep striving and working to manifest this original vision. I very much appreciate the sponsorship of Katati Warner Park Unified School District and ask that you approve our charter renewal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. My name is Chip Rummer. As Dr. Haley said, I'm the executive director at Credo. And I want to thank you for believing in us five years ago and for giving us a second breath two years ago and ask that you'll give us five more years to serve more students as we go forward into the future. Um, I would just want to highlight a few things that answer some of those criteria for approving a charter renewal. One is a sound educational program. Uh, we have existed for two years during when IEPI was assigned. In our first year, 11-12, we had an API score of 822, with a statewide ranking of 8. And in 12-13, an API of 853, with a ranking of 9. In 13-14, as you remember, there was no standardized testing. In last year, 14-15, we did the CAST test, and 57% uh, of our English language arts students met or exceeded standards, and 44% of our math students met or exceeded standards. Um, 
I'm not especially proud of those, but they are actually higher than the state averages and district averages. Um, we intend to have a college prep program. Uh, that meant that we hope for all of our students to meet A2G requirements to be qualified to apply to the university or Cal State systems. Granted, we've only graduated one class, but 94% of those graduates met the A2G requirements. Um, of those students, 45% met, got, were awarded a state seal of biliteracy in Spanish. This year, we added Mandarin to our program. Uh, we, as Maria said, we are fully WASC accredited. Uh, we will go for renewal next year. The longest accreditation for a new school is three years, which we were granted. We had 70 plus courses approved by the University of California. And we were invited to University of California's DLC program, which uh, guarantees admission to the top 9% of graduates to a University of California campus. And we also were invited to a passport to Sonoma State program that um, guarantees acceptance of all Credo graduates who have met A through G who have a 3.0 GPA or higher. So I hope you will agree with me that we have established a sound educational program. Uh, two, are we likely to succeed? Um, academically, as per what I just brought to you, in governments and administration, we've had board stability since 2013. Maria Martinez has been our board president since that time. Patty Yardley is our vice president. And board members, uh, Sam Turner and Kelly Hennessy and Jim Free. So Jim has been with us for about 18 months and the rest of them for uh, since 2013. Uh, everyone has just signed up to stay on for another term. Administratively, uh, I'm still here. Tom Schaefer, our education director, who has been with us since three years prior to the opening of Credo, is still with us. We have uh, stability and some growth in our administrative team. Uh, financially, we are growing our way into financial stability. As Maria said, we currently have 177 students. Uh, we anticipate 240 students next year that will be graduating a small senior class and bringing in a larger freshman class. We have, uh, I believe, 76 or 77 freshmen this year. We expect to have 90 freshmen next year. Uh, we have a balanced budget, and we have for a couple years now. All of our um, state startup loans will be repaid by January of 2016, and we will have a 5% reserve by the end of this fiscal year on June 30th. Facilities is a big question. Um, many of you know or remember that um, a big attraction for us to be authorized by this district was because we have always desired to be located as part of the Sonoma Mountain Village development, which is now rebranded as Somo Village. And the attraction for us there is the uh, model sustainability program. It has some of the most stringent sustainability commitments of any development in North America. And when our development team discovered this was happening here in Sonoma County, we felt like it would be a great opportunity to locate a school within that community so that our students uh, learn, live by, and adopt those values over four years of being a high school student and then disseminate those values out into the world. So we've been working uh, closely with the One Planet Community uh, nonprofit, which is headquartered in London but spends lots of time in Roman Park and with the Cotting Enterprises, which is the um, lead owner of the development, to uh, move into an existing building on that campus by this summer. So uh, we are moving forward. We have an uh, architect that we like very much, who we actually started working with about seven or eight years ago, and we thought we would land there in the first place. So um, the circle comes back. And, um, We're in negotiations with the lease. Can't really talk about the specifics of that, but we're hoping to um, secure that shortly, and I will share updates with the superintendent and staff. So that's really all I want to say, unless I can answer any questions, but I want to thank you for your support. Um, in the beginning, 
in the hard times about two years in and in the uh, more pleasant and positive years since then. Let the, that pleasant, positive success continue for us. Thank you. And Michael Escobel, who's our student council president, would like to speak for a moment. Hello, Paul. <coughs> nice to see you guys again. Uh, my name is Michael Martinez Escobel, and I'm the aforementioned son of Maria Martinez and the aforementioned student council president of Credo High School. Credo is more than just a school. For me and many others, it's a home. It's a place for kids like myself to blossom and truly express who they are. And I have done that day in and day out, along with a lot of my friends, most of them. I have thrived in the encouraging hands of Credo High School and its incredible program and incomparable faculty. I have achieved a 4.0 GPA with endless opportunity for leadership because of the Credo curriculum and community. I have been allowed to explore my passions for the arts and athletics. This is not just me. All Credo students have each thrived and blossomed in their own respect. The wonder that is Credo High School has allowed them to do this. I want this to be available for all students who wish to attend Credo High School because it has truly changed my life and the meaning and importance of Credo High School in my life I cannot express. I trust that the leaders of Credo High School and you, the protectors of the Katati, Katati Runner Park education, can work together to let this amazing program thrive as we have in the past. Thank you for your time and your help. Thank you. Um, I, just, I just want to say I appreciate uh, the relationship that Maria, you and I have uh, worked on over the last couple of years. And I think that um, as a result of, of that, over uh, the last couple of years, we've been able to come to agreements and, and talk candidly with each other um, as to um, where Credo is going. I'm, I'm happy that um, your um, financial um, situation has improved. And um, you know, as I uh, attended your last graduation, that's quite an event. Um, but um, good luck with SOMO, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we'll see you again. I just want to make a comment. Um, like Marie said, two years ago, with this of dark times, <laughs> and I think that it was uh, a part of the process that actually I think brought better understanding between Credo and the school district, and it was. Uh, there was a lot of, I think, hard feelings, but I think we all grew from that. And um, just as you're thriving, we're thriving, and I think it's it's good for the community, and we're both moving forward in a positive direction. So, John, well done. Just a comment, I, I welcome the alternative um, program that, that, you know, adds, not all kids learn the same way, not all kids prosper in the same environment. So I see this as another alternative. I see this as another program. It takes time from startup to be successful. And those were tough years, it was those first years, and I'm, I'm glad that you've been successful. I'm glad that you're producing responsible, educated uh, young youth in our community as, as we're doing. And, it's, and, and um, I see it as a viable alternative and I, I hope you continue to grow as, as we continue to grow. So. Yes, I do want to thank uh, Mr. Romer for being very communicative and timely with the renewal position and his willingness to come in and meet with staff and make any revisions. We really haven't needed to make many revisions and I think that shows the thoroughness that they put into the process. I would add that a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit the school. I was with our uh, director of facilities, Josh Savage, ostensibly to look at the facilities and understanding the, the terms of the lease coming to an end and uh, what we'll need to look at in terms of reopening Richard Crane as an elementary school. But of course, a secondary purpose was just to see 
what the campus life was like, what the campus life was like, and how things were proceeding. And, and I can say, as someone who's visited in the past, it was, a, it was a very different experience. And I think with the staff you have, with the number of students that you have, you've come a long way in, in five years. And so um, I'm sure that they'll have the opportunity to continue and succeed. And I do think it's probably a great match to be out at SOMA which I'm sure has to be ADAA compliant. Um, and you'll want three, three, three A's? A's? Yes. I'm still I'm short of A. ADAAA. And they'll want their high ADA with their class of 90 coming in. Um, procedurally, this was a hearing um, that we've opened that the board president will be asked to close. We're not taking action tonight. We would bring back uh, to you at a future meeting uh, an action item to review the petition. We don't see any problem with them meeting this criteria from a staff point of view. Close public hearing. Item 12 D, call for nomination to the CSB Delegate Assembly. Would you like to be on this list here? <laughs> Delegate Assembly? <Yeah. laughs> I think it would be great. Well, you know, you, you have until January 7th to get that, think it over to the next meeting. <laughs> they really need somebody that's, you know, understands the A, A, A. All three of the A's. So, if your delegate requires you to attend a number of these conferences and stuff, um, <laughs> again, you have until January 7th. So, let me give you some time. <laughs> I, I know of one person um, from up north um, that is thinking about this. Um, I haven't heard of any others that are going for it. This is currently my seat that right. I've vacated. And we don't have to have a nomination because okay. every school district is part of CSBA. Right. San Sonoma County has an opportunity to nominate some okay. service. So we, if you want, we can have this again in December. So I think it's still a yeah. time. Sure. So we'll have it again in December. We'll let you think that. Okay. <laughs> Item 12E, acceptance of gift donations to schools and the school district. It's like um, at Evergreen, we received a monetary donation from the PTA in the amount of $4,000. John Reed, received 22 books from K. Loiva for $176. Thomas Page Academy had a monetary donation from the Community Foundation of Sonoma County of $2,000. And CFPUSD received monetary donations to teachers at various sites from the John Jordan Foundation in the amount of $630. So our grand total that we received was $6,806. Can I get a motion to accept our wonderful gifts? So donations. Can I get a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, item 13, public comments. So I have Josh Todd. Welcome, oh. Josh. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, I'm kind of talking about the, the breaking policy is either in or not in existence. It seems to be kind of confusing. Um, there's an article in the Press Democrat which printed the grading scale, that 20 point grading scale of 80 to 100 to math and, and so on down the line. And so I emailed, I emailed Mr. Haley several times. We went back and forth and he said that that's not the grading policy, that's not the grading system, that's not in effect. In fact, the grading scale is shown on the front page of the Press Democrat. And referenced in their editorial is not sanctioned by the school district and was never discussed, debated, or approved by our board of trustees. It is disappointing how quickly a falsehood can spread. I hope when people read something this that this as preposterous as what the press democrat wrote this week, they would trust their instincts and know that that's not true. And so, based upon that email and other emails I received, and talking to the administrator Ranch Patati, they said this is not the system that's in effect. Um, I went online last a uh, couple nights ago to check my son's grades, and uh, in his English class, he has several 85 out of 100s, and they're all listed as an A minus. 
as a, as a letter grade. So the uh, percentage is 85 out of 100 complete grade is an A minus. Um, then going to another class, he's got 20 out of 25 or 80 percent, and that's listed as an A minus as well. And then he has 15 out of 20 or 75 percent, and that was listed as a B plus. And so I'm just I'm really confused as to if this is not sanctioned by the board, if this is not a grading policy, and this shouldn't be in effect, and why. In fact, he uh, in his one class he has several zeros because the teacher hasn't updated the system yet. And his grade at this point is a 30% and it's listed as a D. And so I'm just really confused as to why um, you know, the discrepancy between the emails, the, you know, the press releases, the rebuttals, the TV interviews, the radio shows and things like that, all denying this grade scales in existence. But when I look at it online for my son's grades, that it is in existence. And so um, I got an email back today from Principal Carter um, and trying to explain some of it, but again, I just, I'm not getting it. She was saying that this is a, in other words, letter grade remains an accurate reflection of the teacher's evaluation and the challenging, of challenging course. So I heard, uh, I was able, wasn't able to be earlier, but I saw online um, uh, one gentleman asking for a resolution with the board to discuss this, but we can do this. I'd like to ask the same thing, maybe some clarification. Uh, from the board as to what the grading system is and the scale that we use for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Item 14, any future agenda items? Any trustees would like to bring to the meeting? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you. Thank you very much.